Uh, okay, so I was asked to speak today. I am a producer up in Teton Valley. We refer to our ranch as PK Land and Cattle, together with my wife, who's sitting right here in this row. Uh, maybe I should go to the next slide. I'll kind of go along with... What am I doing wrong? No, that should do it. it yes, it is. There. Okay, there we go. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, my wife and I raise cattle in Teton Valley. We've been doing it uh, together since 2007. I was born and raised in Teton Valley, uh, fourth generation, in fact. So, um, it wasn't until 2007, though, that I got married and we began in earnest to really focus on what we wanted to do with our operation. Primarily, it's a beef cow, beef cow calf operation. We do raise yearlings mostly as replacement heifers but we'll also raise yearlings for other purposes too. Uh, in the past and up until now really, we've also raised hay, not just as feed for our cattle, but also hay for sale. And in the last couple of years after we've drank the soil health Kool-Aid, we added laying hens to diversify our livestock operation, which has been a good thing. So, uh, in the past, this is a good slide to start out with. In the past, we lived and died by old paradigms that were hard for us to get out of. So we made hay here. We had cattle there on pasture. We'd till the ground. We'd calve here, pasture there, finner, feed and winter in the same spot, start all over again the next year. Everything was segregated. We looked at ground as grain ground, hay ground, pasture ground. We didn't realize that all ground can be whatever you as a producer want it to be. And that ultimately is the best way to operate ground, in my opinion. But those old paradigms, I can sympathize with anyone, even though I feel like I've begun to break out of old paradigms, I still find myself being stuck in paradigms that I can't even see sometimes. So it's good to have somebody like my wife or other producers that you have as friends who will question things that you just take for granted as being gospel truth. So it's good to always question what you're doing and how you're doing things. So we began breaking those old paradigms pretty much right off the bat after we got married and, and, and began working on our operation. So we started experimenting with things like rotational grazing. Uh, we started moving our feed yards, our winter feed yards around a little bit. But what we were really doing was making small changes and we were only seeing small improvements. So all that time that, that we spent, you know, just experimenting with these small things, in my heart, I always felt like there's more to this. There's got to be ways to increase pr pr productivity without handing your uh, bank account over to the fertilizer companies. There's got to be a better way. So we started out breaking those paradigms small, but what really started to shatter those paradigms for us in our family is in, in 20, I think it was 2015, I became a board member for the Teton Soil Conservation District. And at one of those board meetings, you know, as a board member, you're exposed to a lot of conferences and things like this that talk about crop farming. And it was actually the first time I ever was ex exposed to the idea of soil health. I hadn't heard that term before. I hope, you know, I don't want to throw myself out there because I'm in a room full of believers of soil health. But at the time, I hadn't heard about that. I didn't really know what that meant. And so I got exposed to that. And th those are th that's an interesting thing for me. But in my heart, what I always liked and what I cared about was livestock production. And so our district conservationist, I'm not sure if she's here, but Lindsay Markigard and I were in a meeting, and I, and I said to her, Lindsay, if you ever hear of a good um, a grazing school or a grazing conference or something, I'd really like to go to that. And she said, I'll, I'll work on that. So she came back and told me, you need to attend the Lost Rivers Grazing Academy. And I don't know if you in the audience are familiar with that, but it's an academy held every fall in September in Salmon. And it's a week-long academy. You go and spend your entire time there learning about grass and management of grass. 
So, well, and what they refer to it is is management intensive grazing, and that's what we've implemented on our ranch to, in my opinion, great success. I would say probably more than anything else I've done, education-wise, that has made the biggest impact for me as a cattle producer. I probably learned more in one week about grass than I knew all my life leading up to that, and I've lived my entire life around cattle and grass. Uh, on this also, I have NRCS projects. That did help me shatter paradigms because we experimented with cover cropping for the last three years through NRCS projects, grazing cover crops. But we also started implementing on a much larger scale management intensive grazing so that we can bring water to the, bring water to the land in a more efficient way do what I refer to as intelligent electric fencing, where we're, where we're laying out fencing in a way that it makes our life simpler and easier to move cattle across the landscape. That's what we're focused on. We think about how best to utilize and manage pasture. And so we've done that on our own mostly, but also through NRCS projects. So this slide has one of my favorite sayings, and some of you will recognize this. It's out of an old LDS hymn. But improvement and progression have one eternal round. I think about this often when I think about our place and how we manage it. Like I said, in the past when we were uh, suffering through our old paradigms, we, we saw ground as having certain purposes and being segregated. Now we see that all the land we operate has all the uses that we use land for. So feeding, haying, calving, grazing. There shouldn't be a piece of ground that you always make hay on. There shouldn't be a piece of ground that you always calve on. There shouldn't be a piece of ground that you always graze on at the same time every single year and for prolonged time periods. So that is an eternal rotation. It's not just a crop rotation. It's a use rotation and a time of year rotation. It's an eternal rotation. You need to think about that way in advance and lay out your rotations. And I put this, even not to stick my thumb in Marlin's eye or anybody else, but the best cover crop for us, which I, I believe this to be true, is a well-managed pasture. I don't think you're ever going to grow cover crops. Well, I'm not going to say that because we've had success with cover crops. But I do believe if you're trying to push soil health forward as a livestock producer, you're not going to beat a well-managed pasture ground. I don't know that you're going to anyway. Okay, so big changes equal big improvements. Not always. Sometimes big changes mean that you will fail, and that's okay too. But for us, the, the, big, and change, the big changes we've made, we've seen some vast improvements. And I have to look this way so I'm not staring at the light, but uh, the number one big change that we've made was the manage intensive grazing. And by doing that, we have literally measurably doubled our grazing production. Now that... I, if that doesn't speak to you as a livestock producer, I, I'll say it one more time. We've doubled our grazing production. That's the same as doubling the acreage that you run. So we've done that, and we believe, and we've noticed this, that even after we've doubled it, it's continued to move slowly, and I believe it will continue to move slowly as our soil health increases. But I think also a big part of that is it will continue to increase as we get better at management. So it, we are always learning things. We are always seeing things that we could maybe make better or different. As part of that doubling the grazing production, we've extended the grazing season on both ends. Like I said, I'm from Teton Valley. I don't know if everybody here knows about Teton Valley, but we live in probably the harshest climate in Idaho, which maybe is the harshest climate in the U.S. I don't know. You know? And, and we've been able to extend that grazing season both in the spring and in the fall. Now the next one, I could probably spend all day talking about the next one, and you're probably thinking, what does it even have to do with soil health? But we changed our calving sync to be more in sync, or changed our calving season, excuse me, to be more in sync with nature. So under the old paradigms, we calved beginning the 20th of March, through the month of April. 
Now, down here, that may sound reasonable, but in Teton Valley, that is the worst time to be calving cows. We still have snow on the ground. We still have blizzards. We have mud up to our ankles when there isn't snow. It's awful. And so we, we really suffered over the idea of whether or not we were brave enough to change that because we lived and died by the old paradigm that we had to have our cows calved before we went out to grass. The cows had to be up by the barn. We had to be with them every second of every day. We had to, had to, had to, had to do all these things that weren't true. So we moved that back a month and started calving the last week of April. And now I, I'm actually going to tune that a little bit more going forward. I think we're going to start the first week of May so that I'm real confident that we'll always be out to grass by the time we calve. And being out to grass to most people when you're calving, if you're a cattleman, that's insanity. How could you be out on grass? The cows have to be, you have to be out there nurse mating the cows. How could you do that if they're out on grass? Um, I didn't believe it. I, I talked to other producers that were doing it, but I, I had a hard time believing that you do not need to be there to assist a cow when she delivers. And it wasn't that we were assisting every cow that delivered earlier when we were calving in March, but there is something magical about a cow being out on grass. She does not need your help. So we used to pull a few, I don't know, I don't have records of it, but we pulled several every year that we would bring into a barn and help assist in the delivery. Since we've changed that to where we're on grass, we haven't assisted in one delivery, not one. And we haven't lost any calves or any cows through complicated deliveries. So the, the, the other beauty, the, the other reason that changing your calving season is a soil health issue is if you change the dynamics of when the cow is calving and her gestation period, you've now opened your season up to where you're on grass earlier and you can push the cow later in the season. So she, she isn't as far along in December and you're likely to be able to get away with a lower quality forage and push it on the other end. So of all the things we've done, uh, there's two things that have been no-brainer, home runs, out of the park, no questions asked, the best things we've ever done. One is getting better at our management of grass, using management intensive grazing. Number two, hands down, is changing the calving season to be in sync with nature. That There is nothing that somebody could say that would convince me to go back the other way. Uh, okay, the next line, added laying hens to our operation. So we, we did this because we were coming to these kinds of things, and we listened to the Gabe Browns of the world, and they were, they were diversifying. And my ears perked up when somebody said, and I can't even remember who it was, but they said, here is a way to add another rev revenue stream without adding acres. So in the past, I used to always think, well, if we're going to make more money, we've got to take on more ground. I don't have time for more ground. That's just another thing. I'm not interested. But in this situation where we're already out moving cattle, literally every day we move cows through a series of electric fences, we now have added the laying hens in the mobile trailers, as Gabe and other people are doing, and moving them following the cows across the landscape. Uh, I didn't grow up with chickens. I didn't know anything about chickens. I never thought I'd be a chicken farmer. I still don't think of myself as a chicken farmer. <laughs> but it's, it's something we've actually learned to love. We enjoy it. My, I have two small kids. My wife mostly takes care of it as an operation. So we have, the, uh, we've converted old, old horse trailers. She goes out and gather eggs once a day during the summer and feeds them and stuff. And then, I, you know, I thought in my mind, too, as a producer, the next thought is, what are we going to do with all these eggs? Well, you know, I, I don't know how we're going to market those. That has never been an issue. My wife sells them on a subscription basis. She delivers once a week. We have a waiting list. I don't know that we could outproduce the waiting list. So the, the laying hens have been a good thing. The last line, a group of farmers would probably likely laugh at me because who cares about quality of life? Just put your head down, go to work, who gives a damn, just keep going. That's how I've always felt, but the truth is, is our quality of life has gotten so much better, it's immeasurable. When you are slogging through uh, mud up to the axles, going out to doctor scouring calves, life is pretty awful. 
It's pretty awful to go through that. And we went through it for years. We didn't learn quickly. We had to get hit over the head a thousand times before we'd started looking for ways that were better. But our quality of life now is immeasurably better. And I know that our soil health is better, not just because of production increases, because of what Marlon talked about. Literally, you could go and take a shovel full of soil and you know that that soil is doing better. I mean, there's worms, there's life. It looks like black cottage cheese. It's, it's wonderful. Life's wonderful. We also are participating in a study with the Friends of the Teton where we are going to measure how much better we've made soil health. But it's an ongoing study, and it'll take five years before we can measurably show what we've done over a course of time. Okay, PK core principles. This right here is a picture of me and my son out moving cattle on our, on our saddle horses. Um, number one, we, we want to leave things better than we found it. And I'll be honest, in the past, I don't think we were, we were leaving things better than we found it. I, th I think that we may have tried to convince ourselves that we were, but we really weren't. And it was only after we started looking at things from a whole, from a 30,000 foot elevation, looking at your ranch as a whole thing, that we started making things measurably better. And I do believe now that we are leaving soil health better, hopefully our communities, hopefully other things you know, that we're affecting, hopefully setting a good example for people around us, I hope. I'm going to skip the next one, the advocate for animal ag. As much as I hate to come and stand in front of you guys and talk, I feel like it's my responsibility because the forces of radical, stupid environmentalism are working constantly against us, and certainly against animal agriculture, which is the biggest travesty because animals properly managed are the greatest thing that you could ever do for the landscape. So we are willing to come and do things like this, and give our opinion, share our experiences. Can't be afraid to fail. We, we failed many times at many different things. We tried to always keep it within reason so that we didn't bankrupt ourselves or put ourselves through too much financial hardship. But we are experimenting all the time with different things. And it's the only way that you're going to learn. It's I, I, truly learn, I should say. You can come to a conference like this, you can learn something, but until you implement it on your own place and see how it does under your management, I don't know that you'll truly learn. And so we, we're no longer afraid to fail, but we do try to keep it within reason. We try to keep things you know, financially sound. Lifelong learning. Uh, if you would have asked Robert P.K. when he was 18 years old, would he have cared about lifelong learning? Absolutely not. You know what I mean? That would be the last thing that I would have ever said. But the truth is, we, we do dedicate time. I, I especially dedicate a fair amount of time trying to listen to other producers, trying to hear, you know, YouTube is an awesome resource. There is enough material on YouTube for everyone in this audience to spend the rest of their lives listening to other producers who have been successful implementing soil health um, things. So I actually enjoy that. that, that that's a, and it's something that I do with my son. Uh, I have a son and a, and a daughter, but me and my son spend an unbelievable amount of time together, especially in the summers. We move cattle together. We do all our chores together. We do everything together. And I feel like it's my responsibility to teach him what I've learned so that hopefully, coming back to generational operation, hopefully he will want to do what we do. That's uh, When it comes down to that, everything else we've talked about means nothing compared to generational operation. That's our whole goal. That's the whole reason we get out of bed in the morning is to hopefully have something to pass on and, and hopefully have our, our uh, children appreciate what we do. I don't think they would appreciate what we do if I kicked him in the head every morning and said, put on your mud boots, there's three feet of mud, we got to go slog through and stuff this uh, fluid down this calf's throat in the middle of March in a blizzard. He's probably going to go, I don't think I like that. I think I'm going to go try something else when I get a chance. So anyway, th those, those, are, uh, those are some of the things that I wanted to share today. I, I probably didn't stretch that as long as he wanted me to. 
Uh, with that, I'll show you a couple of slides. It, here's uh, my boy's name's Gus. My girl's name's Daisy. This is Gus when we dig in the dirt, looking at uh, looking at earthworms, looking at whatever's down in there. This is Daisy with our our laying hens. Uh, in the upper corner is Gus with one of the NRCS project um, drinkers that we that we put in last fall with some cattle in the background. Here's a picture of us managed intensive grazing with the chickens across the, the, the line where the cows were the day before and the cows on fresh grass. The business that Morgan sells her eggs through, she's named Free Birds. So, so that, that's uh, the subscription business that she sells and delivers eggs on. And in the corner is a picture of me and my wife and kids. Robert, yeah. Sure. Okay. I think there's going to be a question and answer, but you'd probably love for me to stretch this, wouldn't you? Okay. So, so me and my wife run a little over a thousand acres. Okay. Uh, we started out as an experiment with 50 laying hens. Okay. And we, uh, we had, we already had an old horse trailer that we weren't using. I think it's a 16 foot horse trailer pull type. And we gutted that. We took the floor out. We put a metal uh, grate flooring so the manure can fall through the grating. We put rollaway boxes inside of it, rollaway nesting boxes inside the trailer. And then we put uh, water tanks in the front where horses usually, you put your tack or whatever. And then we put it on a gravity system so that there's, uh, it's an automatic water inside. And then we also bought a sun-sensitive door. So it opens in the morning on its own and lets the chickens out into the pasture area wherever you have them moved. And then they naturally, as layers, want to come back there at night and, and they always get in there before dark and then it shuts themselves. So we, we were worried because, uh, I mean, we live in a place where there's coyotes and foxes and badgers and on and on and on and on. So we uh, also got a livestock guard dog. Uh, an um, Akbosh Pyrenees Cross that stays, lives with the chickens, goes everywhere with them, is always there with them. So we started out with 50. That was successful. We added another 50 or so, and, and that's been good. And, and now we're up to 220-ish laying hens. The, the size of a laying hen operation is, this, is the size of your will to have it be. You know what I mean? It has nothing to do with acreage. How many eggs do you want to collect a day? How much feeding, how much time do you want to dedicate to this? I mean, you could have an acre and have a thousand birds, I'm sure. But you added them to their fertilizing. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, well, no, and another revenue stream. Because this is a way, like I said, we don't have to add an acre. And the, the limit, all right, my wife has something to say. What? All right. So yeah, we, we quit using um, uh, fly tags. We, we we don't worm our cattle. So so the the chickens do scratch through the manure patties on each day as you move, and we've we you know we didn't have enough birds, but each year as you grow that number, you, you potentially you will eliminate not a hundred percent, but you'll bring it down enough that you won't have a need to do fly control and things like that, because the chickens scratch through the manure patties, eat the larva out of the manure patty before it hatches. Yeah, no, the chickens are actually a really interesting animal. I've grown to like them. I really do. And they're beautiful out on the landscape. And all the things that you, th you know, the preconceived notions, the old paradigms that people have about chickens. Whenever we'd bring it up to old timers in Teton Valley, everybody had chickens when they were kids. I didn't. But they did. And they'd go, oh, I would never do that. I hate shoveling out the, the coop. I hate doing the, you know, I hated doing this. I hated doing that. And I'm going, well, we don't do any of those things. Oh, and in the winter, you might be winter. curious to know. Yeah, in the, so right now we built a hoop house, a greenhouse, and, and they house in the, in the greenhouse. They overwinter in the greenhouse. Yeah, so I can't, well, do you remember the dimensions? 
it's more than adequate for 220. You need three square foot per bird. That's the math you need on that. And, and again, that's, you know, that might be a limitation for you. For us, it's not. If we decide to go to 1,000 birds, we'd build a bigger greenhouse, you know. <clears throat> but, but they do really well in it. So Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> so the first first year that after we built the greenhouse, we grew pumpkins in the greenhouse, and an unbelievable crop that we didn't maintain because we were too busy during the summer. And so we we did pretty well with that. That's a learning thing too. That's just another thing you can add on to it. I mean, it's not going to ever compete with cattle as a revenue stream, but it's it's another thing. It's a good thing. So we did do pumpkins. We're going to do pumpkins again, I believe, this year. And we set that all up on a drip system, so it was totally, you know, hands-free. Uh, you had a question. With your management-intensive grazing, and you've moved the cattle and bring the chickens in, are you keeping them actively separated, or are the chickens free to come and go wherever the cows are? Chickens go wherever they want to go. Okay. But, but we do keep the cattle away from the coop. See this line right here? Yeah. So, so we experimented with that. We thought, well, maybe the cows wouldn't bother it, or maybe our guard dog would keep them off of the, off of the trailer. But no, cattle are curious, and they want to rub, and they want to do things. So we do keep them separate. The chickens, there is nothing except their own mind as to where they're going to go. But they do tend to stay less than a quarter mile. They don't like to go too far. They always, they, you, the very first time you put the chickens in the trailer, you have to lock them in there for 24 hours and force them to lay in the trailer. Force them to lay in the trailer. Once they've laid in the trailer, that is home. That is home. They always come back to that. They may have a little difficulty initially as to whether or not they'll want to crawl up into the trailer at night. At first, we had some difficulty with them wanting to roost under the trailer. But as soon as you teach them by forcing them in the trailer a few times, as soon as you do that, then you're golden. Anybody else? Over here, Dustin. That's a good question. So the hens are new enough to us that we still have our initial purchase, but we have we have these subscribers that buy our eggs every every week. We're hoping maybe they'll be interested in those as we slaughter them, but we, we haven't really crossed that bridge yet. So I don't want to speak with authority on it, but we will have to deal with that as we go forward. Somebody else? Yeah. So our, the different breeds, I'm going to turn over to my wife. We've had three or four different breeds, and we're still experimenting with that. What are the breeds? Well, I mean, we started with buff orpington because mm -hmm. they're kind of nature, I guess. Then we went to nature, so they were really good. But the uh, last batch I got, uh, red stars, and uh, a lot. A black sex link, too, didn't we? Well, They, they've started laying earlier than the other breeds. But when, when you, if you get serious about chickens, I mean, all that information is there in the hatchery magazines as to what, you know, projected uh, laying capacity and stuff. Yeah. But we haven't settled on one the way we have with cattle. Like, we're raising Angus cattle. We ha we're not buff Orpington chicken producers. We're still experimenting. We do. We actually, we used to do it by hand. She did it by hand. Every single one she would clean and, 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 and package. But we bought a, a machine called the little, <laughs> the little Egg Scrubber. And you can set three eggs in it at a time. And as fast as you, you set it in your sink, the water runs over the top of it. And it's got these brushes with the water going on it. And you set it in. And as fast as you're setting them in, you can pick them out. So I'll set them in. My boy will pick them out. She'll package them. We can go through hundreds of eggs in an hour. Yeah. Anybody else? So how much time every day do you spend moving cattle? Well, that varies, as you can imagine. But if it's just a typical move where we're moving, you know, rolling up and, and putting out line, you know, if it's a quarter mile, it maybe takes us 45 minutes or an hour. 
to pick up a half mi or a quarter mile of electric fence and roll out a quarter mile of electric fence? One thing I didn't touch on this, okay, for, for cattle people. How are we setting up these big, long sections of fence um, and keeping it so straight and beautiful and tidy? We do that with the guidance system on our tractor. So we hook electric fence reels to the back of our tractor. The guidance system keeps us uh, perfect as far as acreage in a straight line. And we can also make adjustments as we go. So if we have a day that we see the grass, let's say we saw the grass we'd overdone the day before, we can make any amount of adjustment we'd like to make with that guidance system on the next day. You know, if we want to kick it up a quarter acre, we could. And, and it lays out the fence as, as fast as you can walk. And then, of course, you're picking up as fast as you can walk. And that's what me and my boy do every single morning. It's, the, it's my favorite thing to do by far, by far. Of all the things that we do, I, everything's downhill from moving cows. Moving cows is like a spiritual experience every single morning. There is nothing better than moving cows. Uh, go ahead again. There's a lady behind you, but go ahead. Great question. So that's the NRCS project. So that's, let's see. So you see this tire tank? So as we go forward, our plan is to bring water to the entire ranch landscape. As we're doing it now, today, to get started, we have, several, we have two or three creeks that run through our place and the Teton River. So you, when you go into a pasture, you start at water, and then you make your daily moves away from water. But uh, admittedly, the system begins to break down after three or four days because the grass closest to water is beginning to regrow and the cattle don't want to go up to the, the, the old new grass, if that makes sense. They want to go to the fresh regrowth. So our plan is to put one of these big tank drinkers on, at the center of every 40 acres that we run. Once it's on the center, you can divide it in any amount of ways that you want to divide it. And when I talked earlier about uh, intelligent electric fencing, so what we do is we take a 40-acre, whatever, 160 divided by 40, you got a 40-acre piece of ground, you put that tank in the center of it. Along the edges, we have the NRCS engineer, Mike Stober, great guy if, if you're not familiar with him. He, he's come out and he will flag out for me... Um, perfectly straight, perfectly measured out um, fence posts on our high tensile perimeter fences to where each post marks a, uh, an acre a quarter mile long. Okay, So it's okay that we have a tractor now that can do that for us, but eventually we'd like to be able to roll up in a four-wheeler and do that without any help and have it be perfect. It's important to me to be perfect. So, so w once that's all built, that then it, then we're gonna we're gonna take those quarter miles and we're gonna go to eighth of a miles because it's much easier to walk out and roll out an eighth of a mile than it is a quarter of a mile. I kind of lost my train of thought. Where were we headed with that? So the water, yeah, the water. So all all these waters are you know at the different places. This place we drilled a well last summer and it feeds an underground pipeline to where it, it can be used any time of the year. Right now we're wintering cows out of this and we chipped the ice. It was 25 below zero this morning. Chip, chip, chip. Good to go. Yep. Four feet. Yeah, four feet. So my initial paradigm was that anywhere we had to lay pipe it was going to be six feet. And that was going to be a fortune to dig a six foot trench for whatever that was, a mile plus. And so he said, you know, you'd save a lot of money if you just went to four feet even. Just that added two feet's a lot more digging. And I was just like, okay, let's, let's give it a try. It'll be a, you know, I guess if it doesn't work, we won't have water in the winter. We'll be forced to, to drink out of the creeks or whatever. This system, though, these, these tanks um, may be a little different than what you're used to. So uh, that has a French drain system on the inside of it. So that water is continuously moving. It comes up in the center and it goes over into a drain pipe that goes out into a French drain into the ground. So every one of our drinkers has a little pet cock on the float, and you open that cap, and you reach inside and open that pet cock, and now you've got water moving all the time. So the, uh, the, all the other drinkers we just let freeze over, and they just keep themselves thawed out in the, in the guts inside the, the culvert. Um, 
We haven't had any issues so far. Hopefully it'll be good. I do worry about high traffic areas driving the frost deep, but I think if you lived in an area like this, four feet's probably adequate. If it's just for summer use though, you can save a ton of money and have them trench it in at 18 inches with a, with a, you know, a pipe trencher. And, and you know maybe there'll be a situation where we do that, but then it kind of takes away from all land, all uses. Because the idea is to be able to win. There's nothing, again, okay, the, I'm making statements here, but there's nothing that will move soil health faster than wintering on the ground. And we do that also intelligently. So we use that same tractor with that same guidance system to perfectly lay out our feed yards every single day. So it's basically having a fertilizer truck come in and work across that landscape. And then we move across that into different, different places each year. Let's give Robert a hand. Okay. Thank you.